to suggest this to Brother Foss. He has been doing such tremendous teaching and preaching. Hasn't he been doing a super job? Wonderful, wonderful material. And obviously his burden is uh, for what God wants to do relative to the recent prophecy. And uh, I told him, I said, I, I was reluctant to mention this because I didn't want to interrupt your flow of uh, what you had planned. And uh, he said, oh, no, go ahead. Let's do it Sunday night. So tonight we want to talk to you about travail. Several ministers have come, and we have heard some tremendous lessons and messages on prayer, on intercession. But uh, no one has really covered travail. And if you recall the prophecy that came to us, God emphasized travail. He said, if you do not bring travail to me, I will bring it to you. And uh, this is very, very strong, God's message to us. So tonight we're going to read Isaiah 66 and 8, and you can just remain seated. Isaiah 66 and 8, and we're going to talk to you about the fourth dimension of intercession, which is, we feel, to be travail. Isaiah 66 and 8. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? And here is the phrase, for as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. I wonder if we could just pray right now, and let's ask the Lord to help us tonight. God, we need your help very desperately. We feel burdened with this uh, subject and we all want to be able to move into that area that would be pleasing to you, that would satisfy the requirement that you gave to us through this prophecy. We need you tonight. We must have you. We cannot do this without you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. It seems that... Thank you. It seems that God underscored travail. If you don't bring travail to me, I will bring travail to you. Although revival is the goal of this prophecy, we are looking forward to a great revival that is coming, that is promised to us by not only this promise, prophecy, but many others. Its emphasis, though, is travail. You see, revival is what we do. It's effort that we put forth. It's that area that we reach for, where God can stir and help us and move us. But it is travail that is our goal. So this causes all of us to ask, just really what is travail? And we want to try to answer that tonight. How do we travail? I want to uh, give you a couple of uh, definitions. They are on your sheet there, but I want to read them, and I'll be adding to them in a little bit. Intercession means to intercede, to act in behalf of someone in difficulty or trouble, as by pleading or petition, to attempt to reconcile differences between two people or groups, and all of this has been covered so beautifully 
previously in other messages. You remember Abraham interceded for Sodom, for Lot, for that uh, troubled area. He stood between them and what God was going to do, at least for a while, until the Lord said, it's too much. Travail, with its different forms, occurs 44 or 45 times in Scripture. So the word travail is, is prominent in Scripture. It is from a primitive root, which means basically to bear young, to toil. That is wearing effort. In other words, an effort that is of such toil that it wears on an individual. It is also defined as sorrow and to labor. Once again, Isaiah 66 and 8 says, As soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Let me give you a little more definition that it's not on your sheet. Travail is from a primitive root properly, and this sounds strange in a way until you think about it. It's from a primitive root, meaning to twist or whirl, to dance, to writhe in pain, to bring forth, to bear, to calve. Once again, it's from a primitive root, meaning to twist or whirl. Now, of course, this would not be in joy. It would be twisting and whirling and, and dancing in pain, to writhe, to twist, to dance in pain, and to bring forth, to bear, to calve. It also means to be pained, to be in anguish. Actually, travail is the fourth dimension of intercession. We're going to attempt to show this. We're going to present to you an overview first of the four dimensions, and then we're going to study them in detail. The first, as you notice, is knowledge. The first dimension of intercession is knowledge. And, of course, knowledge has to do with facts, and we will cover that other column a little bit later. We must know something before we can do something. The second dimension is concern, which is feeling. And concern is the result of knowledge. You feel something because you know something. If you don't know anything, how can you be concerned about that? And then concern leads to burden. It's the third dimension of intercession, or perhaps we could say travail. It's where there is more focus on the facts, more focus on the feeling, more focus on the concern and the knowledge, and it develops into a burden, deep concern. And then the fourth dimension is travail. And we are using the word affliction. So facts, feeling, focus, and affliction. Now, what is affliction? Affliction has to do with burden and with pain. It, it is something that, that creates uh, misery and distress. Now, I want after that quick overview for us to think uh, about each one of these dimensions and see if we can somehow arrive at a better understanding of travail. You see, these correspond 
with the four depths, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more later. The four depths in Ezekiel, when the water was, as he waited, following the angel, waded out into the river, the water was to the ankles, it was to the knees, it was to the waist, and then it was waters to swim in. Let's look first at the first dimension, which is knowledge or facts. We must know something before we can do something. This seems very uh, basic and perhaps an oversimplification. But there's something about the knowledge of a need. It's the knowledge of a need that affects us. Let's look at Nehemiah 1, 3, and 4, and then we'll read 2, 1 through 3. Nehemiah 1, 3, and 4. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. So Nehemiah is in captivity with the rest of Israel, and he hears about what's going on back in Jerusalem. Let's look at the second chapter, 1 through 3. Nehemiah 2, 1 through 3. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. The second verse. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very afraid. And the third verse, and said unto the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchers, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? So Nehemiah was moved with the knowledge when he got the report, when he heard of what was happening in Jerusalem. It stirred him. It moved him. So facts will always precede feeling. Knowledge will always precede concern. Let's look at Paul in Acts the 17th chapter and the 16th verse. Acts 17 and 16. He goes there to meet uh, Timothy. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, the spirit was stirred in him, or his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. This was not on the tour. He did not plan a crusade here in Athens. He was only going there as a meeting point to where they could go to another place. But when he got there, when he saw, when his knowledge, when the facts were revealed to him of how bad the city was, then there was feeling, there was concern. He was stirred. So let's look at the second dimension concern, feeling. This is the effect of facts, the second dimension of intercession. You see, it's more effective when we intercede with feeling. Can you intercede without any feeling? Absolutely. You can be a go-between. You can even pray, God, save our world and have no feeling, no burden. You can say, God, save my neighbors with no feeling or that much concern. <clears throat> and so it is possible without knowledge, just from facts and, and just from knowing a situation to do something about it. But it's much more effective when we intercede, when we go between with feeling. Let's look at burden. Concern leads to burden. It's when we begin to focus on what we know. And when that concern <clears throat> develops into something much stronger. So it's not just facts now. We don't just know something. We are feeling something. But that feeling is not just, 
excuse me, a general feeling. It is a focused feeling. So now there is concentrated concern. There is overwhelming concern. The result of letting the reality or the fact of the lost to get a hold of us. You see, we know the world is lost. We know our neighbors need God and our family and our friends. But it's one thing to know this, and it's another thing to have any feeling about this. But when we get a feeling about this and we begin to focus on this, it leads to a burden. And this is what eventually leads to travail. So the fourth dimension is anguish. It's pain caused by a burden. Deep travail is synonymous with birthing. It's intensified burden. You remember Hannah in 1 Samuel 1. We're not going to read that. But she was barren. She wanted a son. The other wife of her husband would make fun of her and say, You are barren and I have a child. And so she would go to the house of the Lord and, and she began to, to pray and to seek God desperately. There are seven phrases that indicate the intensity of her burden and travail. It says she wept. She did not eat. Her heart was grieved. She was in bitterness of soul. And I'll go back over these in case you're taking notes. She prayed unto the Lord. She wept sore. She vowed a vow. All of these seven steps are an indication of just how intense her burden was. She had gone into travail. She was in pain for this. She wanted a son so badly. It wasn't just a little written prayer request. It wasn't a hand raised. It wasn't a casual remark. I would like a son. I am praying for a son. But she wept. She fasted. She did not eat, the Bible says. Three, her heart was grieved. This is a picture of travail. This is the tapestry of travail. She was in bitterness of soul. She prayed unto the Lord. She wept sore. Now, notice the first one is she wept. But the sixth one says she wept sore. And then it was so strong that she was willing to commit to anything. I will give him to you, God. I will vow a vow that when you give me a son, I will give him back to you. I want to read a few verses uh, that indicate uh, the intensity of Paul's burden. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians 3 and 8. 2 Thessalonians 3, 8. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Note 1 Thessalonians 2, 9. Even him whose coming is after the working. 1 Thessalonians 2, 9 is what we need. 1 Thessalonians, that's 2 Thessalonians. Twice in two verses, it says he wrought with labor and travail night and day. And this is, this is what that verse is saying as well. Let's look at Galatians 4, 19. Galatians 4, 19. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Now, obviously, this leads us to a question. How do we travail? If God's requiring travail, how do we travail? How, we, how do we go into travail? You see, no one just starts travailing. You can't just say, I'm going to go to the prayer room and I'm going to travail. Travail is the result of a process that occurs in steps and in phases and in dimensions before the response of travail. So you don't go into travail by desire. 
I just really want to travail. No. You don't go into travail by request. No one can request. Let's go into travail tonight, folks. No. It cannot be commanded. No one can say, I'm going to command you to travail. So you can't go into travail deliberately any more than you can start crying with something leading up to that. When we weep, there is something that causes that weeping. It may be some kind of an emotional uh, imbalance that we don't understand, but something causes that. You're not just, uh, you can't just normally, I can't right now say, I'm going to start crying. And so we cannot say, I am going to start travailing. So instead of praying to travail, we need to pray to have more concern, which leads to burden, which leads to travail. We need then to pray earnestly for concern. God, help us to have a better knowledge of the lost around us. Help us to face the facts and the reality that souls are going to hell. They're going to burn forever and ever and ever. You see, it's this information. It's, it's this type of, of material that we need to get into our minds. Instead of saying, I, I, want to, I want to be afflicted. I want to travail. I want to really be. No, no. We need to understand what's going on around us. Now, how can we consider or increase that concern? I want to refer quickly to Jonah, the fourth chapter, the 10th and 11th verses. You remember the story of Jonah. God said to go to Nineveh. I'm going to destroy that city. He didn't want to go. He went the opposite direction. As uh, our pastor referred so beautifully this morning concerning uh, the road to Jericho and the road away from God, and Jonah headed to Tarshish to an opposite place. He did not want to go to Nineveh because he was afraid that when he got over there that the people might repent and uh, then the prophecy would not come to pass that uh, they would be destroyed and he would be made to look foolish. And also he didn't like those folks anyway because they were Gentiles. But after the whale ride, Jonah was willing to go. When he got over there, he preached. The city got so stirred that they fasted. They even made the animals to fast. They wouldn't let anybody eat. They wouldn't let the animals eat. They fasted and prayed. They were stirred. They were moved. They were concerned. They were burdened. And God said, all right, because you have changed, I will change what I was going to do to this city. Jonah went out and he said, that's exactly what I thought was hap would happen. He was un." happy. He sat down at the edge of the city and prayed to die. And as he was there, God let a little gourd grow up to shade him. And then God created a little worm to come and, and chew on that little gourd, and it withered, and he lost his shade. And he was so aggravated. He wanted to really die now. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd for which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. And, oh, Jesus, notice this next verse. This is one of the few chapters in the Bible that or one of the few books that ends with a question. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than 6,000 persons? Now, let's stop for a moment. What is God doing? God is saying, Jonah, you are not concerned. You don't have a burden for Nineveh. You're more concerned over gourds. You're more concerned over your comfort. 
how comfortable you are. But let me give you a little knowledge. Let me give you a few facts. You are more concerned over that gore than you are a city of 120,000 people. What's God doing? He's trying to focus on the facts. He's trying to get Jonah to be burdened and travail. He wants him down in this area. You see, God wants every one of us down in this area. But we want to hop down there. We want to get down there. We want to hurry and run down there. We need to face the knowledge and the facts of the lost around us. Do you realize we are living in a city, a metropolitan area of six million people? Six million people. The Lord said, look. Jonah, this is a city of 120,000, and you care more for the gourd than you do for all of those people. Now notice this. Who cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand. What's he doing? He is showing them him their condition. So not only does he rely on population of the city, which we need to focus on to begin a burden, we need to start thinking about how large this metropolitan area is. We need to start thinking about all the thousands and millions of lost souls all around us every day. And then God said, look, they can't discern between their right hand and their left hand. What's he doing now? He switched from population to condition. We need to think about the condition of those who are bound with drugs, those who are bound with sin and immorality, those who are bound with all kinds of horrible evils that will take them to a devil's hell. We need to focus on that. We need to think about it. You say, I don't like to think about that. It causes me to be, have sleepless nights and to be miserable. But God wants us to have a burden. He wants us to travail. He said, if you don't travail, if you don't bring it to me, I will bring it to you. But how do we get travail? We get it by starting to open our eyes and our hearts and our minds to everything that is around us. Our families, our friends, our next door neighbors. When we see somebody walking down the street, when we pass them on the interstate, when we see an airplane going over, whoever, wherever we are, we need to say, God, there is a soul that's going to live forever somewhere. And that knowledge, when it begins to get a hold of us, will begin to work on us. So when our concern is more for our comfort than the condition of the lost souls, there is no burden and there is no travail. This is why we need to think about all of these things. Now, this is one reason God requires travail. He wants us to be concerned, and he wants us to have a burden. Not only looking at the population, but looking at all of the horrible conditions around us. Now, let's go over here to Ezekiel's four levels. You see, when Ezekiel waded out into the water, the water was ankle deep. In ankle deep water, you basically just feel the wetness of what you are in. You are aware that it is water, but that's about all. And that's relative to facts. When you wade a little deeper, he went another thousand cubits following the angel, and the water was to the knees. Now, the walking is a little slower. The water is resisting. It's, uh, it's a little, you can't go too fast because it's, in other words, there's some feeling that is involved. He waded another thousand cubits, and the water was to the waist. 
And here is where feeling becomes a little more focused. When the water is to the waist, you began to feel a little more of its power and its effect. You see, you don't feel buoyancy in ankle-deep water. You don't feel it in knee-deep water. But when you start getting a little deeper, you can start feeling the buoyancy. You can start feeling its effect. And so it is that when we get into burden, when knowledge creates concern, and concern creates burden because facts stir us to feeling, and we begin to focus on that. We wade a little deeper until at last we reach travail, which is affliction, or we are waters to swim in. Now, why waters to swim in? You see, when that water gets over our heart, when we get that much into the water, Listen, you, if you waded out into a deep stream, I remember when I wanted to learn how to swim when I was a kid. I didn't want to get into the deep water. But when I would wade out there, I would start getting frightened because I would start losing control. When that water gets over your heart, you don't weigh very much. The water begins to take over. And you see, that's what happens with travail. When that burden gets a hold of us, when it begins to control us, when we begin to feel the weight of that, we begin to feel affliction, which is pain, which is defined as misery. That's what Hannah felt. It wasn't that she just wanted a son and be nice to have a son. It overwhelmed her. It's very interesting when you study the word overwhelm. It's kind of redundant because whelm means to submerge. So if you're overwhelmed, you are just completely submerged in whatever it is. And so it is fitting that we talk about water when we talk about travail and affliction and this burden because it's when we become so submerged in the burden, that we are overwhelmed with the burden. It begins to control us. It begins to be a feeling that is so strong that, and once again, when our heart gets in it. See, our heart gets into a lot of things, our care and, and our comfort and, and uh, what we want and what we're interested in and ego. But when that burden begins to cover our heart, when that water becomes, is so deep until we are afflicted, we are overwhelmed, we are covered, then we have started to travail. Now, why does God require travail? What is so big about travail? You see, you cannot travail without a burden, all right? You can't have a burden without concern, all right? You can't have concern without caring. You can't care without love, and you cannot love without God. Because God is love. This simply means that we cannot have revival. It's not possible without love. If we fix our love, He will fix our revival. Oh, did God sneak up on us? Yes, He did. He mentioned travail. He didn't mention anything about love. But don't forget the key is love. God is love. He wants us to love him with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength and our neighbor as we love ourselves. 
Well, how can we get into that love? It's not easy to get into that love. First of all, we must face some facts. We must realize some things. We must know some things. In fact, it would help to know some scriptures. Galatians 5 and 6 says, Faith worketh by love. By Oh, I want to have more faith. You know what? If you want to have more faith, faith worketh by love. See, everything is based on love because God is love. What can we have without love? What can we have without God? So he, in a way, slipped up on us. He mentioned travail. He's emphasizing travail, but he knew that that could not happen without a burden. And he knew that a burden could not happen without concern. And concern could not happen without knowledge and without facts. And he knew that if we had concern and feeling, that we would begin to witness what love does to us relative to the lost. You see, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. A few years ago, what, about four years ago now, I suppose, when I was in intensive care for 10 days after bypass surgery. What a time to have to think about some things. I'll never forget many nights sleepless looking at the ceiling in that intensive care unit and talking to Jesus. And you know the scripture that was impressed upon me more than any other verse in the entire Bible during those 10 days. For God so loved the world. I would say each word by itself and then just think about it. For God so, to what degree, loved the world that he gave. His only begotten Son. That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I began to ask the Lord, help me to understand your love. Help me to understand what it means to really love people and to love souls. You see, unless we love We we can't have concern. Unless we love, we can't have burden. And we sure are not going to be able to travail. It's all based on love. So what do I do? I want to travail. We've got to travail. Folks, if we don't travail, if we don't bring travail to God, God will bring it to us. How do we do that? We start facing the facts. We get out into the river. We get involved ankle deep. We realize around us who is around us and their condition. Jonah was really, you know, here he was. He was preaching, but there wasn't much of a burden there. And and you see, we we can go through the motion. We can have knowledge and we can have facts and we can pray and and we can come to church and we we can go through the motion without a lot of concern and a a lot of feeling. But oh, how effective it is when we began to allow that feeling to get a hold of us. When we began to really think about the lost around us and how desperately they need God. Well, how can I really do that? Well, you know, if we could only picture the people around us as our family. I think I mentioned this in a Sunday school class one day, that in our church in Columbia, in a Bible lesson one night, I said, I'm going to create a a scenario 
And I want you to answer this scenario in your mind. Don't say anything out loud. You work at Walmart. You're a manager. A fancy car <clears throat> drives up and parks illegally in front. A fancy dressed woman comes in and walks around, and you happen to see her stick an item in her purse without paying for it. Now, what would you do? Think of the procedure and the process. Well, some thought, well, you know, I'd call the police or wait till she goes outside and then we would have her arrested. And, you know, we definitely, we, we, yes, sir, we would do something about that. And I said, oh, jail or what? Oh, you know. But I said, wait, now, I, I forgot I, I, on purpose, I, I failed to tell you all of the facts. That person is your mother. Now what would be your response? You see, if that lost person is our mother, our daddy, our son, our daughter, our wife, husband, ourselves. You see, this is why that this is built on knowledge and facts. Because we've got to start thinking. We've got to realize that we are in a world that will not continue. Jesus is coming soon. There is a burning hell. All of this is facts, folks, scriptural facts. There is a burning hell, and people are going who don't have Jesus. And they're going to live forever and ever and ever, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And that knowledge, those facts, if we will allow them, they will begin to create concern and feeling. And that will develop into focused feeling and a burden. And that will eventually lead us into travail and affliction. You see, travail, again, is not something that someone asks you to do. It's not something that you say, I'm going to just do. It is a result. Watch a mother whose baby is still in the burning structure, but it is too severe to go in and try to rescue. The timbers are falling. Even the firemen are reluctant to try to do anything. Watch that mother. Watch that travail. Watch the screaming. Watch the crying. Watch the affliction. Notice that there will be, there is an overwhelming emotional response. Why? Because what she knows, she feels. And what she feels is focused. And, and that's her baby. That's her, that's her darling in there that's burning. What are we going to have to do? You know, I don't think it would be wrong for us to create scenarios in our mind. I don't think it would be wrong for us to paint pictures in our mind of hell and, and of our neighbors and our friends and our loved ones going there. We need to do something to get stirred. We can do something about that, but we can't just say, I'm going to travail. There must be a concern that begins to get a hold of us. So we can't travail without a burden. We can't have a burden without concern. And we can't care without loving. And we can't love without God. Because God is love. You know, there's something about 
There's something about love. The Bible says it covereth a multitude of sin. That's why in that scenario a moment ago relative to Walmart, when, when, when we think of our mother, when, when the love for our mother is, is so strong that, that in such a situation we would be more merciful. Oh, that we could, we could allow that to, to soften us and allow that to grip us, that we could create some kind of a situation in our mind to where we can see those lost souls as our loved ones and then our loved ones who may not be ready to go and our neighbors is living forever and ever beyond the reach of help. But see, this is not something that a preacher can bring to you. This is not something your pastor can bring to you. This is not something that anyone can contrive. It's not something that you can somehow say, well, well, let's just do it. Let's just have travail night. Not at all. You can't go to the the, 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 uh, travail room, the prayer room, and and say, I'm going to travail tonight because the need is so great. No, no. When the need is great enough, when the facts create the feeling and you begin to focus to the extent that you become afflicted and overwhelmed and your heart is submerged in the burden, you will travail. I will travail. See, we've never reached that point. This is no indictment. Who am I to indict you? This is not a rebuke. It's just a corporeal, a general confession of the body, I think, that we could all agree with that we have not reached that point to where we can really travail. We have not reached that point to where we are so moved by the need for revival that it changes our schedules. It changes our responses. It changes how we live. It changes our day. It changes our schedule. Oh, God, help us, Lord, to have that feeling. Help us to have that concern, God. Help us to have that love. So you know what we all need to do. We need to leave this room tonight and start working on our love. Oh, Oh, Jesus, I have uh, been considering a Bible study. I don't know if if, a Sunday school lesson, whatever, and I had no intentions of uh, presenting the material tonight, but let me just mention that on a piece of paper, I drew concentric rings. I drew a, a bullseye, another ring, concentric rings. And then I put in those rings, I asked the question, who is in your love circle? Who is in your love circle? You see, the very center, I put me, you, us. In other words, the individual. We're at the center. We're the, that, that's the focal point of it all. We, we, are, we are so egotistical, folks, that we're concerned about number one. But who's in that next circle? Well, that next circle out would be maybe my family. And the next circle out would be maybe my, my friends. The next circle out would be maybe the associates, the people I work with and neighbors and have to get along with. And, but let's, let's keep going. I went way out with some things. I put some Muslims out there. I put some terrorists. I put some gays. I put some adulterers, fornicators, thieves, liars. Do we love souls? 
I will never forget the conviction that I felt years and years and years ago when, you know, there are a bunch of fake hippies today. I lived in the time when there was real hippies. We got some pseudo hippies now. They want to be hippies. They want to be hippies. But some of us older folks remember when all this got started, that hippie stuff. And I would see a hippie going down the highway, down the street. There, there was a repulsion. There was a, you know, long hair and a lot of them dirty and just uh, your lifestyle. It just, and one day I got under conviction. I began to look at that hippie as a soul. I looked beyond the hair and I looked beyond the filthy garments and I looked beyond the lifestyle and, 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 and I began to see that as an eternal dying soul. A soul that's going to live somewhere. And I began to pray. And you know what? Love was born. Love was born. Are we to love hippies? We're to love everybody. You see, many times we feel like we have a real burden for souls. And let me tell you another confession. One day, many years ago, as a young evangelist, I thought, man, I really got a burden for souls. I'm out here on the field, and I'm, I'm praying and knocking doors and preaching and just doing what I can. And just, man, listen, I'm, this is it. Until I realized that my burden was for the down and outer. It was for the poor. It was for those who were impoverished. Those who were, had a lot of problems uh, that were obvious. That you could see that they had, the problems had manifested themselves in the way they dressed or the way they acted. Or their lifestyle that was overt. Until it dawned on me. Where is your burden for the wealthy, the opulent, the sophisticated? Oh, yeah, 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 I just. And then I realized, Bobby, your burden's not burden as much as it is sympathy. Sympathy. I felt sorry. Do you realize God loves the wealthy as much as he loves the poor? He loves a sophisticated over in River Oaks. I remember several years ago when we were evangelizing and I would come in and bring Barbara and we would visit with her family and, and I would want to pray. And so I'd want to, I like to walk and pray sometimes in neighborhoods. So I decided to go to River Oaks. And I walked through River Oaks and admiring the houses, but also praying and I started praying for those folks. I'll never forget one day there was a hedge there, and I went up to the hedge, and I peered through the hedge. There was a beautiful mansion there. And I thought, you know, there's no way that I can get in there. I couldn't knock on that door. There's a gate. There would be probably a servant meet me at the door that wouldn't let me see the owner. So I can't get in there. But I said, God, you're in there. You're in there, God. And so I began to set God on them. I said, God, do what I can't do. I can't knock on their door, but better than that, you can get in there and knock on their heart tonight. Do you realize God spends the night with everybody in River Oaks every night? That's right. He's right there with them. Read Job, and it'll tell you that he, he, he works on people in their dreams. I believe God's dealing with a lot of folks with visions and dreams. In fact, if you've been keeping up with what God is doing in the Muslim world, there are many Muslims that are coming to Jesus today because they are telling stories that they had a vision of Jesus walking up to them and saying, I am God. I want to save your soul. And they've been turning to the Lord by Hundreds and thousands around the world. See, I used to think 
that I had to knock on every door. Sister Mangan would get us crying and praying and feel like we were backslid because we didn't knock on every door in our town. Well, if you lived in Alexandria or if you lived in a small town, you might could do that. You can't do that in great big cities. You can't knock on every door. You can't get into every door. We can't get into every door here in apartment complexes and River Oaks and other nice areas. And I got discouraged, but then I got to thinking, Jesus, you're in there. You're in there. You're in there. I don't have to knock on every door. I don't have to contact everybody. God is dealing with folks. Who knocked Saul's door, Paul's door? Who knocked his door? Nobody. Oh, he he was at the Stony of, that's right, he was there at the Stony of Stephen, but nobody knocked his door. Who knocked Ananias' door? Nobody. What did God do? God knocked his doors. God touched them. We need, in our burden and our concern, we need to say, God, move on the lost. Deal with the lost. We will witness all we can. We will knock all we can and invite and do everything we possibly can. But God, you can get into that house. You can get into that home. You can get into those situations. And so I peered through the hedge and I said, God, save them. Move. Deal with their hearts. Oh, God, help us. To have a greater burden. But how can we? It comes out of concern. Well, how can I have more concern? So many times we don't think about it that much. We don't allow that knowledge and the facts to come to us. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And so I began to pray, God, give me greater love. Help me to have greater love. How do you have love? Well, for one thing, you love your enemies. Well, I don't love my enemies. Yeah, I just pray for them and say, I love you. I can't forgive. Yes, you can. Just say, I forgive you in your mind. I forgive you. Think of your enemy. I forgive you, and I love you. I love you, and I forgive you. I have had people in my life and experience that I've had a lot of problems with. But I began to say that, God, I forgive. I love them. I love them. Did I feel it? No, no. I was in ankle-deep water. I was barely, in fact, just barely getting my toes wet. But I love I love them. I forgive them. In Jesus' name. And you just keep waiting on out, and pretty soon it will happen. Pretty soon you'll get submerged in love. God is love. We will never have revival without love. So how does he get us to travail? By facing the facts, being concerned and having feeling, having a burden, really focusing, and that develops into an overwhelming travail. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. I debated whether to do something. Pastor, I didn't mention or ask if this would be all right, so I'll just ask you right now publicly. And if it's not all right, you say no, and then I'll say I apologize, and uh, then we'll ask the Lord to erase it from their memory that they even heard us have this exchange. Okay. No, I, uh, I thought about and... Uh, I don't know how appropriate it is, but I wondered if anybody might have some questions. Uh, your pastor would love to answer any questions that you have tonight. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, seriously, are there any questions about uh, any material we've talked about or travail? Uh, maybe while this teaching's been going on, you have have thought of some things that uh, maybe you're confused about or even troubled you. I anybody have a, have, a, have a question? Wonderful. No. <laughs> yes, Sister Cindy.
Well, thank you. God bless you. This is not what I asked for. I'm sorry, but thank you, Cindy. I, I appreciate that very much. Anybody have a question? All right. Can we travail? That depends. Has God required it? Yes, he has. Will we have revival without travail? He said it was based on travail. You don't bring it, I'll bring it. We don't want God to bring travail. God can do some, some things, folks. I mean, Jonah was not willing to go, and God brought travail to him. Did I see a hand? Yes, Brother Jim. Personal testimony regarding travailing and what it has done for us. Years ago, uh, back in the late um, 80s, I was going through a severe, very, a very severe situation. And I travailed before the Lord as Daniel did up in the tower. And I did it for several months, three times a day, two to three hours at a time. Sometimes I'll go to the local church and just fall asleep on the pew and wake up and go into derailment before the Lord again, day in and day out for months. And I tell you what, the Lord's blessings were more than what I could handle. Praise God. Thank you. Praise God. Well, travail obviously is the sphere in which we need to move. And, but again, it's not easy. It's not something that we can just do and say, I'm going to do it. You know what, if you are not concerned, if I am not concerned about something, it's very difficult to say I'm going to be concerned. It's similar to the prayer conference the other day. We were sitting in the restaurant having a bite after church with, the, with Dana and Jeremy and the boys. And uh, Benson loves fruit. He's listening to me now. My wife had ordered a salad with some mandarin origin, oranges, and they looked so beautiful, a little stack of mandarin oranges there. And Benson was sitting next to my wife, and it was just too much for him. That little hand just reached over and got him some mandarin oranges and uh, because he really loves fruit. And, of course, the parents said, no, no, those are, those are Sister Gilstraps. Don't get Well, my wife then took some more. And, and gave to him. You see, my wife and I were talking about that, how that it's interesting how we like certain things. We, we don't say, I'm going to like this or I'm going to like that. It's just, it's interesting, uh, the psychology of, of desire. And, and so it is uh, with, with souls. We can't just walk out of here today and say, well, thank the Lord for that little Bible study and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really have a heavy burden, and I'm going to go into travail. No. No, it, it, it just, something has to trigger that concern. Something has to feed that concern. That concern is born out of the womb of knowledge, and burden is born out of the womb of concern, and travail out of the womb of burden. And so we've got to some way awaken. We, we've got to, the cares of this life, and, and the care for souls, they are in constant conflict. And somehow we've got to put God first. And we've got to, to underscore and emphasize the spiritual things. And young people, wasn't that great? Your pastor loves you. He would not have. Well, the pastor really got on to us this morning. No, no, that was love. That was love. And it's so great to see you all here tonight. That was love. And so that concern and that care. You say, I just don't like people. I just don't care for people that much. Well, I doubt if you'll ever travail. But you know what? When we don't like people, it's a spiritual condition. Because when we get enough God and get close enough to God, God is love. You just start loving. 
you just start loving people more. And you start forgiving more. And you start overlooking things more. And you start being tolerant more. You know, I, if you won't tell anybody, I'll tell you something. On the Internet, we'll just have a deal like this. It'll kind of cut off the Internet right quickly. That uh, some of these real hard-nosed preachers that feel so holier than everybody else. And, and you, know, you know, the holier we get the more we tolerate, the more we love. It doesn't create hardness and bitterness and ugliness and meanness and despising one another and resisting one another and wanting to separate. I'm not a part of you and I'm not a part of you. Love is tolerance. Not that sloppy, agape stuff, but Jesus. God is love. Hallelujah. And that's the key to revival. It's the key to travail it's love praise God yes all right then why are you asking it if I answered it <laughs> that's kind of mean right there wasn't it <laughs> how do we reach that point which point to travail I just spent 45 minutes, yeah. No, in your tail end of it, you just finished it. But we've got to put him first. That's right. So how do we reach that? And he answered it. That's good. Putting him first. Putting him first. Pastor? I want to say tonight that this, uh, this really has been one of the most awesome uh, Exposés on this subject that I've ever seen. I think it, uh, I think it, it simplifies it to the point where we can understand it. I'll tell you a, a story very briefly, um, and I thought about this. I wanted to actually say something before Brother Gilstrap closed this tonight. Uh, it's a personal reference, um, but. Uh, years ago, I got under such a burden, uh, I felt that we hadn't really had a lot of people filled with the Holy Ghost or baptized here at this church, and it was in, it was in the 80s, and uh, we were having good church, but it, it wasn't, I really had a burden to see those things happen, and so I, I went on a fast, fasted in uh, several days, and the Lord really told me, you know, assured me that, that it was going to come. Well, I had an experience. I woke up in the night. Um, it was about a week later. Woke up in the night, middle of the night. It's about 2 o'clock in the morning. And I heard a, a person in anguish. I could just, it, they were just crying out in pain. And it seemed so, so real. And... Uh, I thought it might be a young person that uh, had come to church that was had told me that he'd been involved in Satan worship and and uh, but I could hear it. it seemed like it was outside so I got up and <clears throat> I decided when, when I got into the toward the front of the house I could really hear it I mean it was it was, it was pretty strong and so I, w I went outside. So the instant I stepped outside, I no longer heard it. And, and uh, it, it was a mystery to me. I couldn't figure out, you know, what, what it was. So I decided to go back in the house. Well, when I passed back through the area where I usually prayed, it was very strong. And it was like I heard it again. And it was like the Lord uh, spoke to me at that point point said that is the anguish of lost souls I fell to my knees and and I passed right through all of these stages I mean just immediately uh, several hours I wept I moaned and groaned and cried cried out I did not get up from that place until 
it, it was already, I couldn't believe it, but when I finished, it was already break of day. And you know, you know what happened through that experience? I really believe that that experience uh, caused a, a tremendous revival. Now, we'd had, we'd had less than uh, a do half dozen people baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost that first six months of the year. From that point through December 31st, there was over 150 people that were baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. I remember giving the right hand of fellowship to 96 adults in one service in January that year. And some of those people are still here in this church. And you know, but the travail, I believe, I've not had that experience again since then. But it was such an awesome thing. And I believe that it brought the tremendous results. I'm not taking credit for a great revival, but I believe that the Lord used me. And I'm sure that there were others that probably had similar experiences. But, you know, I feel like that God's going to use somebody in a special way. And I appreciate uh, Brother Gilstrap simplifying this to the point where we can understand. You, you know, when you have a knowledge, then, you, then, then it moves right on down to concern and to burden. And then, and then uh, of course, uh, when you really, really get a burden, well, it ends up in travail. And so thank you, Brother Gilstrap. You're welcome to. Oh, I didn't read. I believe that this, he's given me the mic. I didn't really want it. Don't you appreciate him? Come here, Brother Gilstrap. Come here, Brother Gilstrap. Don't you really appreciate this man? Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You know, several years ago, I'm a couple years ago, I couldn't really believe that the Lord had given me such special men of God to be here working with me. Sister Johnson told me several years ago, she reminded me of this just a few weeks ago. She said, you remember what I told you? She said, I told you that God was putting these ministers in and around our church to handle a great revival that's going to come. And she said, when I heard that prophecy, she said, I believe that that was true. And I believe God's going to send a mighty wave of his spirit in this place. Oh, hallelujah. I said, I believe it with all my heart. Now, what are we going to do? We're not going to do like he said. We're not going to say, y'all come down, let's travail tonight. But you know what? Let's allow the Lord to lead us down the path of being used in this very vital and important role. I believe this has pushed us a long way down the road. Don't you believe that tonight? Amen. Amen. Let's raise our hands and thank the Lord for his blessings. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your spirit. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, for this wonderful impartation tonight, Lord Jesus, I thank you for it. I thank you for it. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Amen, amen, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I appreciate you being here tonight. It's a very good crowd. Sunday evening services are out of style, out of style in some quarters but we're still doing it. 
and I'm glad. I wouldn't have missed this service for anything. Amen. Okay. This young man needs to stand in for someone who's sick in the hospital and wants our men to lay hands on him. And I believe that God is able. Why don't we close this service out by doing this tonight. Amen. 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 I'd like to have our mighty men come and let's lay hands on this man. In the name of Jesus. Just stretch your hand out toward him. God knows this need, this person that's in the hospital. Hallelujah, Jesus. By your spirit, oh God. of Jesus. Make sure you let someone know near you that you are very happy that they are in the house of the Lord with us tonight. We're going to pray for Sister Bounds today in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask you to help us. I ask you to stretch your hand out, Lord. You're a healer, oh God. By your spirit, oh God, do the work. Oh, stretch your hand out to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Pray for Brother Mel Adams in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God, this important man, oh Lord, you know how much he means to me, Lord Jesus. I just ask you to touch him, God. 